From a quick glance, Asian Americans look pretty well off. They lead in economic measures such as household income, consumer spending, and education levels. But let's take a deeper look at the numbers. Take household income, for example. The median for Asian households was 85,800 in 2019. But if you break it out, you'll see at the low end Burmese Americans with household incomes of 44,400, less than the median of all US households. And at the high end sits Indian Americans with $119,000. When we add in other Asian ethnic groups, you'll see that the original number of 85,800 might not be as representative as it seems. Asian Americans are the most economically divided racial group in America. While they are more likely to hold high-income white-collar jobs, Asian American workers also hold a significant number of low-income service jobs. So most uh, national data sets look at the community in aggregate. And so when you combine it, it looks like Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are doing well and often disguises, you know, the realities of what those at the lower end of the economic uh, spectrum are experiencing. And this has set up problems for the fastest growing racial group in the US, which includes subgroups from more than 20 countries. When we categorize all of these cultures as Asian American, it leads to generalizations. In reality, it's a lot more complicated. Here's a look at the growing income inequality in the Asian American Pacific Islander community and why it's hard to tackle. The term Asian American Pacific Islanders includes more than 40 ethnicities and subgroups. The six largest groups in the US are Chinese, Indian, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese. Today, Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial or ethnic group in the US. It's also the only major group whose population is rising because of immigration. From 1965 to 2015, the Asian population in the U.S. grew from 1.3 million to 18 million, and 98% of that came from immigration. The 1965 immigration reform have a profound impact on Asian immigration. The policy has two goals. One is to allow for family unification, so that's a humanitarian goal. And the other is an economic goal of bringing in needed labor. The Immigration Nationality Act of 1965 vastly increased the numbers of Asian immigrants in the U.S. It prioritized highly skilled and educated immigrants in careers like medicine, science, and tech. This new wave of immigration helped confirm the stereotype of Asian Americans as the model minority. They were seen as the successful, law-abiding minority who, through hard work, were able to achieve financial success. The concept has been used as a political wedge to minimize the institutional disadvantages other marginalized groups face. Scholars argued the model minority myth hides the inequities in the Asian subgroups. One example is Southeast Asian refugees, who came to the U.S. during the 1970s to 1990s. During that period, the number of Asians working in low-skill occupations grew, while those in high-skill occupations fell. You come here um, as a refugee like my parents did, and you're coming from you're coming from war, you're coming from families that have been torn apart, you're kind of, you know, just dumped in the ghettos where the government can can, can put you and you have a different mentality. It's more of like that survival mentality. For Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, that wealth gap is largely due to uh, immigrant selectivity. That is, different groups are selected from their uh, socioeconomic background and a context of immigration. So that would have consequences on their uh, socioeconomic well-being in the whole society and also their wealth. New immigrants who don't come with a highly skilled work visa often have limited job options because of language barriers, lack of work experience, and education. If you have the skill, you can get incorporated into the larger labor market and move up from there. But if you don't, then you either have to experience this downward mobility by taking uh, low-wage jobs and gradually move yourself up, or you can go uh, through entrepreneurship. Opening up small businesses is more common among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders than, and, than other communities. People don't have other opportunities, and so they, they shift to building businesses as a means of generating income and wealth for their families. My dad came here from Pakistan and lived in New York City before he married my mom. So in, while he was in New York City, his first job was at Duane Reed, unboxing and being a load guy. And 
he worked a ton of odd jobs like that and he really did whatever he could and as many jobs as he could in order to build his wealth and in order to just have a footing in America. My uh, family told me that I am the like an inventor. So I can say when I started business, I, mean, I don't have any family member or any friend in this kind of business. I was just keep looking at it and I have a confidence myself that I can learn. But after me, I, a lot of other family people and the friends, they got in this kind of business. Recent studies have found that the AAPI population was more likely than any other racial group to ask friends, family, or rely on themselves for financing or business advice instead of going to institutions. My parents were from Vietnam and they immigrated over to America in the 1980s. They were boat people, they were on a boat and traveled to Thailand and then uh, had a sponsor in California. So they landed in Oxnard, California. So they didn't have any skills or any job opportunities. So they started a little 97 cent general merchandise store in Fort Wayne, California. They didn't have the money to hire people. So they used their children to work for low pay or even no pay. But by doing that, they were able to provide for our family and put all of their four children through college. For some groups like Taiwanese Americans, Indian Americans, Chinese Americans, um, outcomes like income and college attainment might look good. Um, but because some of those groups are larger, Indian Americans and Chinese Americans are the largest Asian American groups, their positive outcomes on many of these measures um, end up masking all of the struggles that many other groups face. Burmese Americans represent the poorest subgroup of Asian American Pacific Islanders. Their median household income, 44400 is about half of the median income of Asians in the United States. Only 16% of the subgroup have a bachelor's degree and 25% live in poverty. Yen U's family moved from Myanmar to New York City in 2009. To support the family, her mom did a variety of minimum wage jobs that didn't require English proficiency, like jewelry packaging and babysitting. We were always qualified for food stamp and Medicaid. Her mom has been unable to work during the pandemic due to a disability. While Yen has become the breadwinner for her family, she's been working since she was 16 years old. Like off the books worker at like, whoever in the community needed like an extra hand. I've always been trying to work because there was never enough money to have disposable income unless I go out and make it myself. Today, she's working three jobs while attending Queens College with federal student aid. I do often feel a disconnect from my native friends and native by native me, birth, like by birth American. They don't really feel the burden of, I gotta make it because we sacrificed everything for, for my mom to get me here. My life is not mine to live because it's, it's my mom's hopes and dreams are riding on it. Yin's goal is to buy her mom a house one day. Like 54% of Burmese Americans, her family has lived in rental properties since they've arrived in America. If you're looking at household income, chances are there's many income earners within that household. And so what we see is higher rates of overcrowding, you know, uh, we have multi-generational families sharing small spaces, again, because our lower income families are living in the highest cost housing markets. Not only do we need more affordable housing, but we need housing that accommodates a family. These are the same families that make our cities run. Data for Asian American Pacific Islanders has become less aggregated in the past 20 years. 2000 was the first year the census had separate categories for Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian other Pacific Islanders. Advocates have called for better aggregated data sets and more accessibility and transparency in the methodology, but some say it's not enough to close the gap. In addition to things like disaggregating data, making sure language access is in place, we as a community need to continue to build. It's amazing to see the number of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders running for office now. You know, many of our organizations are much stronger and able to um, really move the needle in what's happening in their communities. So it's really that longer term building that needs to continue to happen if we want to see things change for our community. During the pandemic, it was found that Asian American Pacific Islanders experienced some of the worst economic effects. 
as more data comes out post pandemic, it could be an even darker reality. You're gonna see a phenomenon where those who are more fortunate probably did better. We did a study supported by the James Irvine Foundation that found that Southeast Asian and Pacific Islander communities were more likely um, to work in gig professions. And we know the kinds of economic struggles uh, that the gig economy has presented during the pandemic. I think once all of the data come out from this 2020-21 period, we're going to see these inequalities actually get worse uh, in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community.